Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you who promised that when two or three are gathered in your name, you would be here among us. We ask you to be here now, sending down your Holy Spirit, enlightening our souls and minds that we, in all that we study, that in our studies and our deliberation, we might glorify your holy name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, well, thank you, Peter, again, and Annie, and uh, everybody coming in here and joining in together. You know, I was, I was, as I was preparing to be with you this evening, um, I thought, you know, I wonder how many people have participated in our Swords and Serpents series before, um, and uh, and uh, how many haven't. So, I'm, I obviously we have a diverse crowd. We've done this series before. It's a one. It's a series I love to do. A study I love to do during the Advent season in preparation for the nativity of Christ. And it's a study which I think is, 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 is built into our liturgy, especially the, the, uh, the, the liturgy in which the, ge the genealogy of Christ and the gospel of Matthew is proclaimed. Because that genealogy is the whole of salvation history summed up in a few verses. And it's meant to do for you what we are going to be doing over the next uh, six hours together, right? three weeks together, two hours each night. Um, although I might trim that, hopefully trim that down a little bit for you, because I know on the East Coast, it's going to get kind of late for you. Um, but uh, um, we'll definitely do two segments each night. But it's that, that genealogy, the begats, right? The, the, the genealogy that everybody, oh, no, it's this Sunday again, right, is meant to be one of the most exciting. It's a tour de force through God's, through all of God's work among men. And each one of those names is supposed to spark like an explosion in you, the story which is around that person, so that we might learn how God acts in the world, how he intervenes in our story, um, that we might begin to learn and recognize his presence in our own life. So our study over the next six hours, over the next three weeks together, is to bring all of those stories out for you okay so whether you've participated in swords and service before or not i want to encourage you to stick with it we're going to be covering a lot of material we're going to be going really fast i remember one of the first times i taught this uh this series i was teaching some deacons in tulsa oklahoma and it was designed as a as a one week one day course okay six hours i think i was doing eight hours in those days and we were blasting through salvation history and finally about five o'clock in the evening this deacon slams his bible closed he says that's it i give up <laughs> that's too much it's just too much information and i was i was like with my you know, fire hose into his mouth just <laughs> and it was all too much for him stick with it my brothers and sisters and i'm telling you whether you've done it before or not there's going to be things that are new, things you're learning. Um, I was going over things today and going, oh, I, I had forgotten about that point, that insight, that way that the, 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 the scriptures are written and things like that. So I was learning in preparation to be with you tonight. I'll be learning with you this evening, okay? And I'll also be asking you guys a lot of questions. So feel free. You want to take yourselves off on mute. If you've got a vacuum going on in the background or something like that, kids screaming, then you can leave yourself on mute. But otherwise, Maura, take yourself off on mute. Others, you know, if you've got a basically a reasonable sound back there, Feel free. It's okay to leave yourself off a of mute tonight, and we'll enjoy our time together. I want to start with you with the story of the resurrection account on the road to Emmaus. Okay, Luke chapter twenty-four, verse twenty-five. And Peter, again, I know we're trying to get a good recording, so if you want to leave people on mute, I understand, but at least know where your unmute button is. So I'm gonna call on you, and bam, you're gonna be off of mute because we gotta do it together. Okay, Luke chapter twenty-four. Um, the two guys on the road to Emmaus, right? There it is. Um, and uh, you can kind of just, you know, I'm not going to read over it, right? We're going to start, it starts there, verse 13, right? That very day, two of them were going to the village named Emmaus. Okay, you know the story, right? I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer me. So Angie, you know, Hannah, wherever, whoever wants to jump in here, 
and, and, and those that are not on screen, by the way, you can, you can um, chat in. Peter, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we are going to change the rule tonight a little bit. We're going to leave chat open. So we're going to open it back up because I think we closed it. But if you chat on something I'm not saying or a question I'm asking, we're throwing you out of the whole program. Just throw you out of the ICC like that. You'd be out in the outer darkness, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. So I don't want this back and forth chat going on. But if I have a question to ask and you want to answer it, you can write it over there. Peter, is that okay tonight? Okay, cool. All right. But if I see a bunch of chit chat going on, out you go. Okay. Road to a mass. Let's go. Angie, what's wrong with these guys? What, what, what did they not do? Right. So Jesus shows up and they don't recognize him. Right. And they're, what are they doing? They're wringing their hands. They're, they got their, their hairs pulled down and they got tears are coming out of their eyes. They're saying, saying no, not again. And the, the Jewish authorities went and they killed this guy. We, we had hoped that he was the Messiah. Right. What did they do wrong, Angie? They, they lost the hope that they knew who Jesus was before the resurrection, but they, I don't think they had the faith to actually believe that he was going to be resurrected. So they weren't expecting to see him. So they weren't ready for him. Okay. Uh, yeah. But there's something more. I got to get it out of you. Okay. What is there? There's something more. Mora, come on, Teresa, jump in there. Maria, what's wrong? They're Give walking away from Jerusalem. Well, this is a problem. <laughs> yes, this is a problem. But no, in the text, give me a verse. What's wrong? Okay, right here. Open your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible out, go get your Bible right now. If you don't own a Bible in your house, close this program, go down to the store and buy yourself a, a Bible right now. Okay, because you got to have a Bible. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. What's wrong with this particular scene, Inez? What's wrong with these guys? They are so close in their own grief that they are unable to recognize the risen Jesus. Yeah, but and they're why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a verse. Give me a verse. I would go for. 18. I mean, you're you, look. You guys are all right. Okay, but uh, yes, yes, but no. Okay, I need some more out of you. Look at verse twenty-five. Because what's Jesus say? He says, "You, you foolish man. Did you not? Did you guys not get it? And what did they not get? What did they not get? Go ahead, Teresa. Take yourself off of me. That the Messiah should suffer." um all these things and why did they not get it because they were slow to heart to believe all the prophets spoke yeah okay so 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 i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give you the answer okay <laughs> ultimately they didn't see jesus in the context of all that had come before all the prophecies about him right they're mm -hmm. seeing him they're, they're they're following him they're hoping in him they're grieving about what's happened but ultimately jesus says I mean, how does he solve their problem, right? He gets, he pulls the Bible. I, I'm not yeah, the first one to say this. Wouldn't it have been great to be in that Bible study? I mean, you'd be like, yeah, sign me up, right? Sign me up for that Salvation History Bible study, not Father Hezekiah's, because Jesus would have would have shown me and I would have seen, yeah? That's the ultimate problem, right? They didn't see him in context. And that's the fundamental problem that we face also that we don't really know the context of the gospel. And because we don't know the context of the gospel, we end up trying to pull emotional things out of it. Even the, the teachings of Jesus, the parables, and apply it to my life, okay? And then we, and we, and we, and we struggle with this, yeah? But, but we need to be following the example of Christ, right? We need to do what he did. If, if, we, if Jesus wanted to solve these guys' problem, which he did, what is he going to do? He's going to go back and go through salvation history so that they can then see what happened and what he did in its proper context, and which is what he does, so that they can come to faith, right? So ultimately, that's what you have to do. Context, context, context. A text without a context is? No text at all. No text at all. Exactly. Yeah. And then ultimately, when you do this, when you place the gospel in its proper context, right? When you put the, when the diamond is set in its, in its, uh, what do you want to call it? The, 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 or, or with the emeralds around it, right? In its proper setting. That's what it's called. The jewelers and the ladies know this. If the diamond's set in its proper setting, then what happens, right? It, it just comes alive. What happened to these guys? What happened to these guys? When this happened, when Jesus did this for them, Angie, what, what does it say? What, what is it? What, we're not our 
It's burning within us. Yeah. So this is our goal over the next three weeks together. Uh, my job is to give you heartburn. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and in this, we will begin to see, hopefully, through the Old Testament stories, the plan of God for our lives. Okay. Now, in order to do this, we need some tools because the Bible's not easy to read. And this is another mistake we make, a problem we have as modern Americans. We want it to be easy. I want to open it up and read it like it's the New York Times. Okay. Well, I hope you don't read the New York Times, but if you do, you know, you want it to be an easy read, right? It's not easy because it's written by people that lived a long time ago in a different culture. And it was written in a different language. And it was written to different people. The Bible wasn't written to you, Joan. Matthew wasn't writing to you, uh, Hannah. Okay? Moses wasn't writing to you, Shane. That doesn't mean that what they wrote isn't applicable to your life. But the first thing you have to do is understand who wrote it and to whom it was written. Yes? I'll talk about that in just a second. You need some tools. I want to get really practical with your tools, and then I'll come back to the who wrote it and to whom it was written. So here are some tools you need. Because I think most people, they, they grab their Bible, and, and, and then they just, you know, they dust it off. Oh, we got to do our annual Bible study at the ICC, you know, or something like that. Blow off the dust, and here we go, right? Now, now Maura, I know you're an exceptional student. Yes, Maura's got her tools ready. So basic tools that are really helpful to you. Number one tool um, that I'm going to, I'm going to, well, not number one tool, but one of those tools is something we put in the resources page. Um, and it's kind of an outline. Peter, we're going to pull this up. We put it in resource page. You can print it off on your own. You can make it the size of your Bible from your printers, what I recommend. And then you can tape it on the inside of your Bible. You see, that's what I've got taped the inside of my Bible. And this is a little, nice little outline my brother put together many years ago. It gives the basic uh storyline the basic years uh you've got the, the the well the first line there the the the, the years leading up to christ right five thousand two thousand fifteen hundred and so forth so you got the basics okay and then you've got the the main events right early history the time of the patriarchs from egypt and so forth like that all the way through the next line down and you can use your mouse there peter um uh adam and noah abraham these are the major characters okay and then the next line is the most helpful this is, these are the historical books. And if you read these books, and this is what we're going to be going through basically in the next, over the next six hours here, we read through these books, you're going to get that basic storyline, but notice underneath that there's books that fit into that timeline that are not part of the historical books. And it means they tell parts of the same story or they fit into that historical narrative. Does that make sense? And this is, a, this is a, major, a, a major problem that we face, especially when it comes time to the prophets over there under 2 Kings, is most people think that the, that the, that, that the, book, the Bible should read like a normal book, right? One book after another, after another, after another, telling the history. And that's not the way your Bible's organized, okay? So, um, Peter, pull this down. They can print it off. You print it off on your own. Don't worry about it right now but I want you to have as a tool, okay? There's one tool. Okay, the second tool is some Sharpies and highlighters, okay? What do you got to have in your Bible case? Mora, show us what's in your Bible case. Hold it up. Pull it up, Mora. You see that? There's her, there's her highlighters. So you're going to have highlighters for your Bible. Okay, I highly recommend this. And you're going to have themes with highlighters, okay? And if I've done this with you before, just stick with me for a minute. We're going to get to the Bible and we're going to do it. But you got to have your tools. So your highlighters are very important. And your highlighters should make sense to you in their meaning, okay? And, and so they, you know, it depends on, it depends on what, what colors mean to you. You ultimately got to make it up, right? I mean, yellow, obviously, is kind of just general highlight, right? For me, I use... Um, I use purple for kingship, right? That makes sense for everybody, doesn't it? I use um, I use green for for life, okay, for life giving things. I use blue. I use some people. Say, my brother uses blue for heaven stuff. I use it for for sin because it's cold. It's a cold color. I don't know. You got to do it on your own and come up with it. Highlighters are very helpful. Okay, fine. I also recommend a straight edge in your Bible. Uh, your Bible case. I, I don't know where I stuck my straight edge. I keep losing my ruler, but a little tiny ruler, a little straight edge so that you can draw lines in between ideas. Very helpful. Okay. Um, 
Look, your Bible is a piece of art. It's a tapestry. It's not written in a, in, a, in a chronological order all the time. And it's not given to you in basic historical chronological order. It's delivered to you as a piece of art. And you need to be able to have that piece of art pop off the page so that you can see its pieces, yeah? And they can come together as they're meant to come together for you, okay? There are... There are patterns, there's repetitions, there's structures, and you need to be able to bring those patterns and those structures out uh, off your page and your highlighter, your ruler, all of these things are going to help you with that. Okay. Um, uh, uh, well, an, an example of this, by the way, and the use of, of, of your highlighter and your tools is, uh, is when you have repetitions of a theme. I'll give you an example. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one. There's a repetition in Genesis chapter one, uh, verse four, verse four. And God, are you with me? Genesis chapter one, this is the first book in your Bible, Catholics. Here we go. Genesis chapter one, verse four. And God saw that it was good, right? That is repeated over and over again in Genesis chapter yeah. one, right? Yeah. And notice in Genesis chapter two, um, 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 in verse nine. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight. You see, that this, this is a theme of seeing, right? Um, uh, look, at, uh, look at chapter 3, verse 3, verse 5, verse 5. And this is, this, this is the devil speaking. And, and God knows that, that, uh, that when you eat of it, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. Yeah, and you'll be like God knowing good, good evil. So you see this, this theme of, of, of seeing. If you're using a pen and a highlighter, you can go through all of Genesis chapter one and chapter two and chapter three with this theme of seeing and, and highlight those, those points and make them pop out for you. And you start to see some connections that are extremely important. Mm -hmm. But if we don't do this and we leave our Bible as this piece of white paper with typed words on it it just becomes blah and you can't you, you're not going to be able to have them pop out i can open any passage in my bible okay and i'm going to okay i'm going to open up i didn't even look at the chapter and verse okay i'm like this orange for me orange covenant which look at this be merciful even as your father is merciful Okay, this is talking about forgiveness. So this is, my, my, this is a relationship with another person. In a covenant, two people are joined as one, right? So this is how we relate to one another. So I can go through my Bible anytime I do. Blue, it's going to have to do with sin. Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Okay, all right. So do you see, the, see what I'm saying? These are tools that are handy to you to help you draw out from what is otherwise a, a piece of paper with a bunch of typed letters on it to draw out the picture. Okay, it's necessary as we start making our way from Genesis to Jesus together, because there's it's a tapestry and it's beautiful if you start to see the piece of art that was placed on the page for you. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Another tool that you want to have in your tool belt is a concordance. Okay, this is a nice little concordance, the Catholic Bible concordance, uh, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition because I have an RSV, it works for me. The concordance is a, has all the words that are in your Bible together. So like today, I looked up the word Sodom, because I was looking, I was trying to make it, I was doing a little preparation for it to be together. I looked up there's Sodom, and I actually found it the first time it was used, was where I was hoping I was going to find it, was in one of the genealogies, okay? So I would know who the, type, who the people are, where they came from that lived in that land. So this is helpful. I use this about four times, five times a day in preparation to be with you. And having a concordance is a nice tool to have. Okay, fine. The last, one of the last things, the last thing is that you want to have in your Bible. Well, I didn't mention it. You should have a Bible case. Yes. Something to stick your Bible in so that you can put your tools in there. So I've got a little handy thing. It's just the size of my Bible right here. All these maps. It goes in my Bible case and it helps you go there, right? It helps you go to the location, go to the spot, see where they're at, get your, get the picture. <laughs> because my brothers and sisters, anybody, any old fool can read the outside narrative. If you're a reader, you can read it. But it's going to take you work to get on the inside, to see the picture around you, to hear 
what's being said, to hear the rivers flowing, to smell the flowers, yeah, um, to, to taste. All of your senses should be filled up when you're reading the Bible, and that's going to take uh, some work, okay? I had out here for you, St. Ephraim, one of my favorite quotes. I've shared it with you before. I'm going to do it again right now. Um, uh, at the beginning of his hymns on paradise, in which he says, I had it open and then I foolishly closed it. Okay, he says this, joyfully, he's talking about Genesis, joyfully did I embark on the tale of paradise, a tale that is short to read, but rich to explore. My tongue read the story's outward narrative, while my intellect took wing and soared upward, yes? And then he goes to describe what he sees inside the story of Genesis. That's what you have to do with your Bible if you speak to you, to communicate to you all that it's meant to communicate, okay? And remember, Jesus says, says the bird, he says, look at the birds of the air. Remember, look at the birds of the air. Solomon in all his glory wasn't clothed like one of these. Well, what's Jesus talking about? For those that have been in the Holy Land with me to Galilee, you'll know that some of the native birds there are parakeets. They're all over the place and they're large. They're like, I don't know if they're parakeets. They're like halfway between a parakeet and a parrot, but they're colored like purple and gold and green and they're really brilliant and they're everywhere. Jesus is, look, that's, see the bird right there, okay? That, otherwise, it doesn't make sense to you what he's talking about. He's not talking about blue jays and blackbirds. He's talking about parrots and parakeets. Now, that makes a lot of sense about what he's saying. Solomon always never, never looked like that, right? No. God's going to take care of you, he's saying. So you have to allow these things to be what they're supposed to be for you. And that's what we're going to try to do together. Look, Catholics are browbeaten. Ooh, we're told that we don't know the Bible, okay? And Protestants are the, the Bible Christians, right? That's what we hear, They're the Bible Christians. It's absolute nonsense. I say to my brothers and sisters, your Protestant brothers and sisters are with us. I love having you with us. You're welcome to go on this ride with us. This is a Catholic Bible study. We're doing it, we're doing it the Catholic way, yep. Um, and so I'm gonna just tell you the truth. The Catholics do know the Bible, but we've been convinced that we don't. And we were convinced that the guy down the street with the, with, the, with the storefront that says Bible Church are the guys that really have the Bible and really know the Bible. But I have to tell you that the Bible was not written for the coffee table of heretics. We must reclaim it as our own. You know, it's, it's kind of like someone, someone steals, a, uh, steals a Ferrari. You know, he drives up to your house. He says, hey, you know, David check my Ferrari out. Go, come on, let's go for a ride in my Ferrari. So it's a lie. It's not his Ferrari. He may be driving it, but, but, but it's not his. Yeah. The Bible was written within our family for our family. It's your book and you must reclaim it as your book. Okay. Now, one last thing before we move on from the tool saying is that is I, I just get it out of the way because I know it's going to come up in Q and A and that is what translation should you read? Stop hiding behind translations. I have like 50 different translations in my bookshelf because every translation, every translator is a traitor. That's the old, the old line, right? Because no translation is perfect. So, so I, 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 encourage, I encourage you, use the Bible that's in front of you. Don't hide behind the one that you don't have. And you have to go on this long trip of always buying the new Bible that gets published. I don't particularly like new Bibles. Give me the old one that's kind of worn out and kind of brown and it's got the juice coming out of it from being used. That's what I want. Yeah. So use your Bible and keep your Bible. I couldn't, I wouldn't, couldn't live without it. I got off the bus one time in Greece. I, we were going to the airport to fly out of Greece and I, I couldn't find my Bible. I flipped out. I told the tour guy, I says, I'm out of here. I'll find my way home by myself because I thought I left it in the store. And the bus left without me. As it turns out, my Bible was on the, on the bus. Yeah, that was, that was unfortunate. But eventually, I got to reach our group. But that's how important your Bible is. And you want to love your Bible and keep it, okay? Um, yeah, Catholics are brow, browbeaten that we don't know the Bible. And it's not true. We just know it in a different way. Catholic, uh, Protestants tend to know verses. 
and they'll take that verse and they'll beat you over the head with the verse. The basic storyline, if you've got this in your head and you can apply it wherever you're at in the Bible, a movement in and out of communion with God. Yes, Adam and Eve are cast out. Abraham is called back in. Uh, the, 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 the sons of Israel sell their brother Joseph into slavery. And so you want to be a slave master and do slavery stuff? You end up in slavery, right? They end up in Egypt. And then the Exodus, Moses brings them out. Yeah, and back to the eventually back to the promised land with Joshua. All right, and the third and final movement is Babylon. Okay, about 700 years before Christ, Jerusalem is conquered. They're cast out to Babylon, 70 years. They come back in, and voila, Jesus. That's it. Your whole Bible is, that's it. Three basic movements. As you got those before you, everything in your Bible is going to fit into that. Okay? Um. Uh, um Again, the problem we face is that the books are not in, in order, right? That story, that movement in and out is not in a chronological order in your Bible. You can't just turn your page and expect that the next page is going to tell the next part of the story. And this is ultimately what trips us up. The first, the first thing people hit usually, come on, what stops you from being able to read your Bible in that kind of, as you're trying to do that chronological order is the book of Leviticus, right? You hit Leviticus like a concrete wall and you die, right? Nobody in their right mind, can read through the book of Leviticus. Let's be honest. I know like two people in my entire life that like Leviticus. My brother's one of them, okay? So, you know, and Mora. There you go. It's, it's, it's Mora and my brother. That's it, yeah? So you hit it and you don't know what to do with it because you're not supposed to hit it that way. And if you know where Leviticus fits into that storyline, you're going to be able to make use of it in its proper way. The other one that trips people up a lot of times is the prophets. The prophets are not in chronological order, most of them, okay? They're, they're, they're put in your Bible from longest to shortest, right? Longest to shortest. And, and so you need to be able to take your prophets your reading and stick them in the right spot in the story. Does that make sense? And if you can do that, I'm going to show you how you can do that. Then you can keep it all uh, you know, all in order. And that's not the only problem. We know the big names. We know the big events, but we don't know how all of them are related to each other, right? Let's, let's, let's play, let's do a little game here. Okay. Ready? ready, ready. Who, who, let me just, just humor me. Okay. Who were our first parents in, in, in paradise? Well, come on. Who's, who's going to be my Angie? You're going to be my, uh, my whipping. Yeah. Okay. There you go, Angie. Who are our first parents? What are their names? Are they? Good, good, good. Do, do, who recognizes, raise your hand, who recognizes the, the name Noah? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. we're all in the same. We've got that one, right? Right, right. Okay. Who knows the name of Adam's and Eve's third son? Yeah, exactly. Okay, some of you crazy ICC junkies, but the rest of you people don't know it. And the problem is if you don't know Adam's third son, you can't possibly know who Noah is. Okay. Um, um, who knows who Abraham was? Raise your hand. Yeah. Who knows who Shem was? You can't know who Abraham was if you don't know who Shem was. Okay. Who know who recognizes King David? Yes, King David. Oh, yeah, we're all on board with King David. How many do you know who Perez was? Mm, yeah, again, again, you, you, uh, you, you Bible junkies out there. A few of you. Yeah, but a lot of you don't, right? And that's the problem. You can't possibly know who King David was if you don't know who Perez was. Okay? All right. How many of you ever heard of the Babylonian exile? How many of you know who Rehoboam was? Yeah? If you don't know who Rehoboam was, you can't possibly know the story of the Babylonian exile, what happened and what happened. Okay. How many of you know, how many of you recognize the name Jesus? Yeah. We're all on the same page together. Yeah. Yeah. How about Zerubbabel? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. See, Zerubbabel. If you don't know who Zerubbabel was, you can't possibly know. You thought you were a Christian, but, but you're not because you don't know Zerubbabel. If you don't have devotion to Zerubbabel, I mean, forget it. You're lost. 
So we're going to try to build that devotion along with that, uh, the, the heartburn business. We got to get some devotion going in this group to Zerubbabel because the guy is legit. He's totally awesome. I, om I almost asked the bishop to name me Zerubbabel when, uh, when I was ordained, to, but, but, but Linda wouldn't allow it, you know. So we need to build bridges of understanding in our Bibles. We need, to, we need to come to know the stories which connect the stories. We need to come to know the people that connect the people. And if we do that, then suddenly that genealogy in Matthew, your head's going to blow off on genealogy Sunday because that's what it's meant to do. The heartburn is going to just blow you right out of your chest because it's that good. Yeah. You got to know the people that connect the people and the stories that connect the stories. We're going to, that's what we're doing. We're not going to be resting in this Bible study in the stories, you know, we're not going to be resting in, in the flood narrative and the story of the Exodus and the, all those stories, you know, forget about it. We're going to the stories you don't know that connect the stories that you do know so that we can put all the stories together and you're going to be able to walk from Adam to Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. All right. There's 73 books. There's a ton of authors, each writing with his own style. But there's also one author who's writing one book, the story of salvation history. We need to learn to read through the fingerprints of the human authors so that we can grab hold of the hand of the divine author. Normally, we open our Bibles, what, at the beginning of Lent, right? Or, or maybe on New Year's Day, right? We sign ourselves up for the Bible in a year program or, or, or maybe, or maybe, uh, uh, you know, you got having a hard time in life, going through a difficult time in your marriage or whatever the case may be. So what do you do? You know, I'm going to get out my Bible, dust it off. I think I remembered where I stuck it 40 years ago and I open it up and I start reading, you know, and I, and it's, it's like playing Russian roulette with God. Don't do it. You're going to die, you know, because you're going to open up to a passage and it's not going to be particularly inspirational. You're not doing yourself any spiritual benefit by doing that. So don't play Russian roulette with your Bible. And what happens? We start reading. And where do we stop? What's the first thing we hit really where we have to stop? You know, Teresa, come on. Let me be honest. You've been reading your Bible a long time. We hit, we hit that big list. Come on, take yourself off and mute, Teresa. Yes. The genealogy. The we first hit the genealogy in right? Genesis. The, the begats, right? And you're like, <laughs> no, I'm skipping that part. Well, my brothers and sisters, there's the problem, right? You're skipping a part in your Bible that's meant to be there for a reason. Do you think, think, think about this. These people thought that God had called them and them alone to save the world. They believed that they were the chosen people. Do you think within the first couple of pages, the first couple of chapters of the story of their story of who they are, they're going to waste a whole page on a bunch of nonsensical baguettes? Do you really think that? No, it, the first story, you're not going to do that. You're going to write down the most important information, aren't you? And that's exactly what they did. The genealogies are critically important for you to be able to read through your Bible, to get from A to Z, from, from Genesis to, to, to the book of Revelation. Everything matters. Everything in your Bible matters. As we will discover, oftentimes, the things which seem to be most, at least consequential, most inconsequential, are really the most important. And we need to understand why they are there. And then we'll be able to make use of them as they were meant to be used. One more thing to keep in mind. We're going to jump into Genesis. One more thing to keep in mind. We need to make a distinction between reading literally, a literal reading of scripture, and a literalistic reading of scripture. Literal, I don't know if literalistic is a right as a as a real word, but if it's not a real word, it should be. Okay. Reading literally versus reading literalistically. Okay. Reading literalistically is, is reading the a very superficial 
a very superficial reading of your Bible, taking everything that is said to mean exactly what is said and no more. In a very childish way of, of looking at the scriptures. However, we are to read the Bible literally. And what does that mean? It means trying to ascertain the original intention of the author who's writing and trying to ascertain what it would have meant to those who received it. Hmm? Reading literally versus reading li literalistically. Okay. What is meant by the original author? What did it mean to those whom it was written? What did God want us to understand by, by reading this? An example is the seven days of creation, right? So many people take the first, the first chapter of your Bible. And um, I, look, if you, they, if you want to hold to a, a, a 24 hour, seven day creation, I have no problem with that. But I, but, but it was not the original intention of the author that that text be used in evangelical so-called science conferences. That was not the intention of Moses. And when you take the text and you try to make it do something it wasn't intended to do, again, I'm not saying it didn't happen in that way, according to a 24 hour, 70 period, but it certainly wasn't the reason why it was written that way. We need to ask ourselves the questions, who, what, why, where, and when. You keep those in front of your mind, and you're going to have, you're going to have the keys, you're going to open up your Bible. Who wrote it? To whom it was written? Why was he writing? When was he writing? Okay, what was he writing? Oh, wait, who, what, why, where, when? A a a ask your questions. And you answer those questions, you're going to be 99% of the way to, to, to understanding what you're reading. And it's a lot of work. It's not easy to train ourselves to stop, to slow down, to read in this way. But if you do, you're going to start to suck the, out of the scriptures the spiritual benefit that is hidden there. We need to start seeing the big picture. The Bible as one story. I'm going to give you an example as we get started here. Turn your Bibles, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Take a look. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. You with me? You got it, Travis? Right there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. And good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. Okay, and so forth. Like that. Okay, now stop. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. That's in the New Testament Catholics. Book of Revelation. Yeah, Luke, you got that? All right. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. We're going to discover why. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. Remember, remember where God dwelt in Genesis. Remember who walked in the cool of the day? It was the Lord. The dwelling of God is, is with men. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. And look at chapter 21, 22, verse 1. 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of the water of life. Remember Genesis chapter 2, verse 10? He showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with his 12 kinds of fruit, yielding a fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed. Remember where the curse ha happened. You see, it's, it's, it's all Eden to Eden. 
It's all a restoration of God's original plan. And if we keep that plan at the forefront of our mind, then we will understand the movements of sacred scripture toward that communion and away from that communion. And every time man draws toward that communion, that's what it looks like. And that's what the restoration of all things looks like. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. God's original plan restored to us. The Bible is the story of God's home and our journey in and out of that home. It's all about communion. Communion with God or communion with the devil and the results of that communion. Our father stands knocking at the door of our heart. Remember, our hearts were burning within us. And man either receives that gift and walks through the door into God's home, or he walks away. When we share in God's home, we share in his life. And his life is eternal. And death will be no more. But when we walk away from him, we will discover only death. And by the way, this whole thing, as I said before, and we'll come back to it again and again, can be understood geographically as a movement in and out of paradise, as a movement toward the house of God, away from the house of God, Eden to Eden. It's a simple paradigm. The whole Bible is the story of man struggling with his communion, struggling with his sin. Oh, a hundred thousands of people, just like you and me, struggling with the very same things we struggle with. That pattern is repeated over and over and over again for us throughout salvation history until we realize that we are standing in the middle of a family who has gone through it all before. And they stand to our right and to our left to strengthen us in this journey back to paradise. We're jumping into Genesis chapter one. We're going to do one, two, and three very quickly. And all, the only thing I'm going to do it right here, guys, because you guys know the story, right? You've read Genesis chapter one, two, and three, ad nauseum your whole life. You know it. So I just need you to grab a couple of themes out of it because these themes or ideas are going to pop up again for us many, many times as we move forward, okay? And so I'm going to say things and, and you can write them down. I'm not going to bring them to a conclusion because I'm going to be talking about them as we move forward. Does that make sense? The first theme or idea that I want you to have in your tool belt is, is, is the seven-day creation. Okay, uh, and I'm going to say more about the number seven in a minute, but just putting it out there that, 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 that Moses writes in a seven day structure. Okay. Um, that's, that's the first theme or, or, or idea. Okay. The second one is given to us in Genesis chapter uh, one, verse 28. So look at verse 28. Okay. The story of the creation of, of, of Adam and Eve. Um, um, you know, I'm going to go, let's go verse 26, and then we'll go 28, okay? Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, okay? So man is creating the image and likeness of God. We're going to talk about what this means, how he's to live out this image and likeness. Ultimately, as we're going to see in a moment, to be in the image of, your, of, of someone is to be a son, to partake of the nature of the other one, okay? We're going to see that here in just a minute in Genesis uh, chapter uh, chapter mm -hmm. 5, okay? Um, so you can just write that down, okay? To be in the image of light needs to be a son, okay? Verse 28, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That theme of blessing is critically important as we journey through salvation history. What does it mean for a thing to be blessed? It means to be filled up with the life of God, right? When a thing is blessed, it's made holy, and holiness is an attribute of God. Yeah, to, be, to, be, to, to bless a thing is to fill it up with life, okay? Notice, notice here in, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that uh, man is told to do three things, three commands. I, I mentioned this to you guys before. If you've been with me for a while, um, three things to be fruitful, multiply, to have dominion and to till and keep the garden. Okay. And he's told these three things because of who he is. 
of what man is, right? Man is made in the image and likeness of God. He's meant to live that reality out. There's an old philosophical phrase that action follows being. What a thing is determines what it does, right? If it, if it, if it, if it, if it, um, uh, if it's a dog, it barks. Or you can look at what a thing does and you come to know what it is, right? Notice the, the what Adam and Eve are supposed to do. They're just supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Yes, what, or, they're supposed to have dominion and just tell and keep. What happens, what kind of person tills and keeps a garden, guys? A gardener, right? Mike, a gardener. It's, it's not by accident that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene on the day of the resurrection in which our human nature is restored to what it was supposed to be. He appears to her as a gardener in the garden. Of course, he's tilling and keeping her soul now, right? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, what kind of person has dominion? A king, right? A king has dominion. And when a king has dominion, not like the dictators of today's world, but has, has as king acts as in the image and likeness of the king of all, what happens to his kingdom, right? When good dominion is exercised, what happens to his, his kingdom, right? The economy flourishes, right? It, all the parts of it are working well together and it grows, yeah? Just like a garden is tilled and keep, it grows, it's fruitful, it multiplies. When a husband and wife are fruitful and multiply, what happens? They're fruitful and multiply, right? Children are born. Do you see on every one of these commands, the same reality takes place? That life grows, it prospers because they're in the image and likeness of the one who has poured out his life to us. Yes? Okay. So again, some themes, images that we're going to keep coming back to. Adam and Eve were meant to be, to be kings in the image and likeness of the divine king. They were meant to be gardeners in the image and likeness of the, of the one who planted paradise. Yeah? Okay. I mentioned the seven-day structure. We're going we're gonna to come back to that many times in scripture. We're gonna, right here in just a few minutes, we're going to see another time when that seven structure is used. Um, we have to understand that the number seven shares a common root with the word covenant or oath in Hebrew. And that common, that because it shares that common root, oftentimes the number seven is used as symbol or sign of something more. So why I was going after the seven day creation narrative, because you have to understand why God created within a seven day structure, why it's written in a seven day structure, because it's meant to communicate something more to us. Turn your Bibles very quickly with me to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. You're going to see an example of this. Um, and, and the basic story is that Abraham meets this other king guy who's living in the, in, the, in, the, in the promised land. His name's Abimelech, okay? And he has an argument with the guy because Abraham and his, his guys have dug a well. And Abimelech's guys are using the water from the well. And Abraham says, Abimelech, what's going on? You're stealing my water, right? And notice in chapter 21, Verse 25, when Abraham complained to Abimelech, not no, Abimelech, for, hold on for a second. Abimelech is, is, a, is a title the guy has. It's two words in Hebrew, Melech. We're going to meet another Melech pretty soon. Melchizedek, yeah? Melech means king. Abi, Ab means father and when they took the eye on the end of it it's my father yeah? rabbi my teacher yeah abimelech my father my father is the king so obviously this guy is the prince he's the son of the king and eventually he's going to be the king okay so when a, when abraham complained to abimelech about the well of water which abimelech's servants had seized abimelech said i do not know who has done this thing you did not tell me and i have not heard of it until today so Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set apart? And he said to them, these seven ewe lambs you shall take from my hand, that you are a witness for me that I dug this well. Right? So they make an agreement that the two are going to be of one mind. Yeah, the two are going to be of one. This is what a covenant or we in modern American time, we talk about a contract, right? In, in, in a similar way, right? A contract, I give you, I just saw on the, on the, on the news the other day, the Dodge truck is, is, is selling for $43,000. Like the basics Dodge truck, $43,000. My head blew off, okay? 
I give you $43,000, which I don't have, and you give me the truck, right? And we're going to be in agreement. We're going to be as one as to who owns this truck and who has the 43,000, right? That's what a covenant does. It makes the two one or, or contract. And we're talking about trucks. Yeah, this is going to be used. The number seven we use then to communicate something more than a simple seven days creation story. It's, to, it's meant to tell us that God is creating so as to be united with, to be made one with, to have communion with his creation. Okay, look at, turn with me to v Ephesians chapter four, verse four. If you don't like learn, turning your Bible, you're not going to like this Bible study. Ephesians chapter four, find it, it's in the New Testament. One body and one spirit, as you were also called to the one hope of your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, turn your Bible to chapter, Ephesians chapter one. Look at this, Ephesians chapter one. Verse nine, he's going, to say, he's going to say the same thing. Go ahead, Teresa. Take yourself off mute. He has made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times. Okay, stop. So, see, hold, on, hold on. See, Paul's going to tell us what the plan of God is. You want to know what God's plan is for you? He's going to give it to you right here. And he's not going to charge you anything for it. Free of charge, here's the plan of God for you. Go, Teresa, what is it? To sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. Yeah, to, br to bring it all together, yeah? What's your translation? Yeah? Uh, it's New American, sorry. That's a, okay, verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite. Yeah, to bring all together. Uh, sum up doesn't quite get there for me. To unite all things in him. Whether in heaven or on earth. That's the plan. That's salvation history. That's the reason for all the stories. As we, as we break communion with God, we go away from that truth, that union with him, that covenant with him. This is why the number seven is critically important in your Bibles. Okay? All right. The, the, the last thing I need your tool belt is we, we already looked at it in chapter one or ch chapter two, verse nine, and that is the tree of knowledge and the tree, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Right? The eat from the tree of life, what's going to happen? They're going to live forever, Catholics. It's not by accident that Jesus, who restored us to that which we lost, gave us to eat that we might live forever. That's God's plan in the very beginning. Yes? The tree of knowledge of good and evil, if they eat from it, or at least if they eat from it in disobedience, they would receive not life but death. Now, re and remember, it does not say that God said he would kill them. No, he's not the author of death. He says they would surely die because they broke communion with God. They became disobedient to God. Yeah. He warns them of the consequences of their actions. We'll see a lot of death in our time together. We'll keep this in mind. Death is never the will of God. God desires us to live. But when we turn from him, we embrace a life apart from him, a life which has as his one defining mark, death. We will discover life apart from God. We call it mortal life. It's a funny term, mortal life, death life. Because without God's life, there is no real life. Okay. Okay. I said that was the last theme or thing before we left Genesis chapter one, two, and three. I got to go two more. One is walking and hiding. We're going to see that theme a lot in salvation history. Those who walk with God. And those who do not, those who walk with God versus those who hide like Adam. Remember when God walked in the cool of the day in paradise? What did Adam and Eve do, Angie? They went and hid themselves in shame. They hid themselves in shame. So there'd be a big difference between those that hide themselves. We're going to see as we get going, we're going to see Saul, who's a bad king, hides himself in the baggage because he's such a wimp. Okay. And but versus those who walk with God. And this to be a continual theme that we pick up walking with God, okay? Um, uh, and, and finally, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, critically important, the Proto-Evangelium, the first good news, Genesis 3, 15, after the fall, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise or crush your head, and you shall bruise or crush or strike at his heel, Yeah? 
So right here at the very beginning, we know something that fundamentally important, and that is there is going to be a battle. There is going to be bloodshed. This is why this series is called Swords and Serpents. There is going to be a battle. Blood will be spilt on this earth. And God will not stop fighting until he crushes the dominion of the devil and frees us once again and restores us to paradise. And when man embraces sin, then the ancestral sin of Adam, the curse of death, will manifest itself in their bodies too. As some have said, there are many, many people resting in the tomb who are very much alive to God. And there are sadly very many people walking upon this earth in which death has already taken hold. They are the walking dead. There will be enmity. There will be a battle. There will be blood. There will be death. And there will be victory. That is the story of salvation history. And it is told to us here first in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We're so sensitive in, in 2022 in our modern, you know, uh, uh, about all of these things. Get all that sensitivity out of your mind. Do not be confused. God and the devil are at war. And the battlefield is the soul of man. When we embrace the evil one in whom there is no life, Sooner or later, that choice will be manifest in our bodies. And God will not stop until he has reclaimed his son and given him back his image and likeness and made him once again the priest king of paradise. The Bible is not boring. No way. It is the greatest battle story of all time. The harder the devil fights, the more mankind joins him, the more blood will be spilt on the earth. Now, this truth, this, this reality is incarnated in the next story of your Bible. This is what has happened to our first parents. And so the very next story that is revealed to us is an incarnation of that reality. It is a story of Cain and Abel, chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read it together very quickly. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And you know the rest of the story. Cain becomes jealous of his brother. And he kills him immediately, immediately out of the gate. We have the incarnation of the divided heart of mankind. Cain represents the fall of Adam and Eve. And Abel represents the salvation that they desire. And through these two boys, the split and the civil war, the battle of salvation history begins. And it begins like the only battle which the devil has, has, has sought can begin, and that is with death. Now, the first thing we hit out of this story is a genealogy, okay? Take a look with me at, at uh, chapter 4, verse 17. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son. Hold on to that thing. Hold on to that piece. Very important. Call the name of the city after the name of his son. Okay. We'll talk about that just a minute, but you might want to highlight that one because it's important about the division between the sons of God and the sons of the devil. Okay. Enoch to Enoch was born Irid, and Irid was the father of Mahujalel, and Mahujalel the father of Methuselah, and Methuselah, the father of Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the other was a first problem. <laughs> Not a good idea. Two wives, bad idea. Yeah? As we keep reading here, Lamech took these two, and, note, and then going to come down just for time to uh, verse 23. 
And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for, for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech is avenged 77-fold. My brothers and sisters, with Lamech, we have the full incarnation of evil, a man rejoicing in death. And this is all laid out for you in a very understandable pattern. As we read these men from Adam, count with me, the generations. Adam, verse 17, Cain, uh, 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 Cain's son was Enoch. Enoch's son was Iron, Iron, Mahujel, Mahujel, Methusel, Methusel, Lamech, okay? Seven generations from Adam to Lamech, the full covenantal union with evil, with death and with sin. The fathers of the church tell us that Lamech killed his great great grandfather, Cain. Mm. That's scary stuff. And immediately, we begin the next genealogy, the genealogy of Adam and Eve's third son, Seth. I asked you about, Seth, about their third son earlier, right? And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel. Was Abel a righteous man? Yes. So now we know we're going to start to hear of the righteous line versus the evil line, okay? Um, uh, to Seth also, verse 26, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. There's your second phrase. Notice Cain's son. They began, they, they, what does it say? In verse, in verse uh, 17, they called the name of the city after the name of their son. You have to know that the word name in Hebrew is Shem. We're about to meet a Shem coming up in the genealogy. They tried to make a name for themselves. They tried to make themselves glorious upon the earth instead of making God's name glorious, right? There's the difference. There's two different uh, uh, genealogies. There's two, a split in the heart of Adam and Eve, right? And now we're getting to get the genealogy of the sons of God. Verse chapter five, verse one. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Man, male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when he created them. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness. After his image, he named him. There it is, right? To be in the image of, of another is to be a son, to partake of the nature of the other person, okay? All right. And look at, 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 verse, at verse six. When Seth lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. Now count this with me. Adam, Seth, verse 6, Enosh. Verse 9, when Enosh lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. Verse 12, when Kenan lived the, uh, seven years, he became the father of Mahalalel. Verse 13, sorry, sorry, verse 15. When Mahalalel lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. Verse chapter verse eighteen. When Jared lived on, he became the father of Enoch. Verse twenty one. When Enoch lived sixty five years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah three hundred years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty five years. Enoch walked with God. I told you it says you had that in your tool belt, right? Like God walked in the cool of the day and Adam hid himself. Now we discover a man who walks with God. And what is the result? And he was not for God took him. And brothers and sisters, seven generations, not through Cain, but through Seth, brings us to Enoch, who walks with God and has full covenantal union with him, which means that death has been destroyed, for he has communion with the living God. Turn your Bibles with me very quickly to, uh, to um, where do I want to go? Hebrews. Hebrews in the, in, the, in the New Testament, yes. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 5. Are you with me, Teresa? I know we're going fast. Go faster. Come on. 
The end of my book is uh, it needs some stitches. All right. All right. We'll give we'll give Teresa a couple couple minutes. All right. Got it. Hebrews chapter eleven verse five. Check this out. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. My brothers and sisters, my Protestant brothers and sisters, if you've got a problem with the assumption of, of the mother of God, you don't have a problem with the Catholic church. You've got a problem with the Bible. We were not meant to die. God's design was not that we were to die, but that in our covenant union with him, we would live. And be taken up into the abode of God himself. Yeah, who else was assumed into heaven? Elijah? The prophet? Yes. Mary's not the only one. This was God's plan from the very beginning. Here we are. Uh, uh, um, chapter, we're going, to, going back to Genesis now. Whenever I have you turn to the New Testament, you got to keep your page, which I did not do. Okay. Chapter 5. Okay. And, and now, notice, now notice what happens. Chapter 5. Genesis chapter five, verse, um, first, uh, 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 where was I? 22. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah, verse 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech, 780 years and so forth. Verse 28. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son and called his name Noah. My brothers and sisters, Noah is the rightful descendant of the sons of God. He, he's, he, he's the he's the great, great, grand, great, great grandson of Enoch. He's the great, 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 great grandson of Seth, who lives in the image and likeness of Adam, who was made in the image and likeness of God. This is where the story of the flood fits in. And notice what we learn about Noah right away. Verse 29, verse 29, and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief. With Noah begins the restoration of paradise. Notice in verse, chapter 6, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. You see that? Now pay attention, underline that word righteous. The, 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 the Hebrew word for righteous is zedek. Z-E-D-E-K. Zedek. Now we talked about abimelech. Melech means king. Zedek means righteous. So when we turn, we bring melech and zedek together, we have a title, which means king of righteousness, king of righteousness, which is going to become the throne title for the kings of Jerusalem, for the sons of God, for the righteous kings who live in the image of God and walk with him. We're going to meet a man named Melech Zedek very shortly. Melchizedek, the righteous king. Yes, because he has the throne of his father, which goes all the way back to the throne of Adam, which goes back to the throne of God. Now, we are at the, uh, the 30 minute mark of our second session. I'm going to show you something which you can do. I'm going to encourage you to do this at home with this genealogy. You thought genealogies weren't important? My brothers and sisters, they're the game. And if you know the genealogies, you know the game, and it's not that hard to do. So I'm going to introduce my son, Vincenzo, is going to come up here and join us, who's preparing to be a gift for Jesus here at Christmas, and uh, he's going to go ahead and give it to you. Go ahead, let's start it out. The, the, our first parents' names were, go ahead. Adam was the father of Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, and God gave them a new son named Seth. Seth was the father of Enosh. Enosh was the father of Kenan. Kenan was the father of Mahalalel. Mahalalel was the father of Jared. Jared was the father of Enoch, who was taken up into heaven. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. 
who built the ark at the time of the flood. That's it. I'm stopping you here, buddy. All right. And that's from memory. He's not reading that. Okay. He's going to be able to do that for you through this series. We're going to do this together until we bring together the whole genealogy of Jesus from, from uh, the whole genealogy from Adam all the way to Jesus. Okay. I'm going to encourage you to do that this coming week. Memorize your genealogy. And if you say, I can't do that far, it's too much. It's fine. Here's what you do. You say, our first parents' names were Adam and Eve. They lived in the garden, right? They had two sons. Their names were Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel and God gave them a third son to replace Abel. His name was Seth. Yes. And Seth had a great, 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 great grandson whose name was Enoch. And he was taken up into heaven. He was the seventh in the, in the uh, generation, the seventh in the line, the covenant union with God. And, and Enoch had a great, great grandson, whatever it is, who built the ark. His name was Noah. Noah had three sons, which we haven't gotten to Shem, Ham and Japheth. It's that easy, okay? You can you don't have to remember all the names, but you have to know the storyline. And if you got that storyline, it's 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 all there for you. I mentioned chapter five, verse twenty nine, the beginning of the reversal of the curse. Okay, and I finally have to look down. I haven't looked at my notes in, in about twenty minutes, so I have to find out where I'm at in my notes to make sure I don't miss anything. Give me a second. Mm hmm. Notice now. The whole of the story of the flood, and you're going to go back and read this now. I'm going to ask you to read the story of the flood as your homework, along with learning the genealogy. Okay, the whole of the story of the flood is told to you, and I'm not going to get into much of it. We're just going to point out a couple of things. The whole of the story of the flood is told to us as a story of decreation and recreation. It's that pattern I was talking about, in and out communion versus not in communion right the whole of the story is told us there's a repetition many times you can look in chapter uh, uh chapter uh seven verse four and you'll see the first time the seven days are mentioned the seven days are repeated all over throughout the whole the number seven all throughout the story okay uh in the beginning god separated the waters above and the waters below. In the flood, those two, the waters burst forth from the blow and they, they come pouring down from the top. The waters are joined back together again. But in the beginning, there was darkness on the face of the earth and God spoke, let there be light and light cast the darkness out. Now with those wa the waters, the flood waters coming back together, now there's darkness upon the face of the earth again. Okay, the whole of the story of the flood is the story that it tells you about the decreation of creation and then in the center of that story chapter 8 verse 1 chapter 8 verse well before you get to chapter 8 verse 1 look at verse 22 chapter 7 verse 22 everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died go back to genesis chapter 2 genesis chapter 2 verse 7 then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Do you see this decreation theme going throughout? Okay. And then God remembered Noah. Chapter 8, verse 1. Don't think God forgot about Noah. Okay. God doesn't forget about things. It's a biblical idiom, a biblical way of saying that God's about to intervene. He's about to act in a serious way to bring about the restoration of mankind. That theme of, of God's remembering. When God remembers, he brings the person forward and begins to act as only God can act. And now from chapter 8, verse 1, there begins the recreation of creation. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and notice how it's told to us in chapter 8, verse 7. Notice what, verse 7. What's, what's hovering over the face of the waters? Like in chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis. What, Teresa, what's over the, the face of the waters? What's hovering over there? Yeah, Mora, go ahead. Uh, Teresa, go ahead. The the wind. Yeah, the wind. The remember, wind. you remember. Go back to chapter one, verse one, in the of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and it was void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And the spirit of God was was moving over the face of the waters. Yeah, the word in Hebrew for wind is the same word for spirit. R U A H in the English and our in our alphabet ruach. Okay, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Yeah, and notice what is the first thing that Mo that Noah sends out from the ark. What's the first thing he sends out? Come on, Serena. Yeah, Serena's got her hands full. That was unfair of me, Paula. Go a ahead. Dove. 
Yes, a dove. Exa- no, 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 not a dove. A What's raven. A raven. And the scene Jerome picks up on this very beautiful. He says, Noah sends a raven out of the ark so that the raven might represent the darkness which was over the abyss at the time of creation. Then he sends the dove, a symbol of the spirit, and drives the raven out. And he says, don't think that the waters parted at the time of the flood by accident or by the ceasing of the rain. No, the waters part of the time of the flood by the blast of God's nostrils, by the spirit of God parting the waters so that the dry ground could come forth again and man could once again stand on that ground like Adam before the fall. The recreation of creation. Notice chapter nine, verse one. Chapter nine, I got to calm down. I have a heart attack over chapter nine, verse one. Okay. And God, what does he do? He blesses Noah. And what's he say to him? Be fruitful and multiply. Yes. Noah will come forth from the ark. And the first thing he will do is worship God and have children, of course. He will be fruitful, he will multiply. And in verse 20, we're told what kind of man he is. Huh? What kind of guy is he? Come on, Gina, take yourself off a of mute. You guys, I'm going to stop telling you, take yourself off a of mute. I'm going to throw you out of here. Teresa. Man of the soil. Gina, what kind of guy is he? He's a gardener. He's a gardener. <laughs> he plants a garden, right? He consumes from that garden. And through consuming of the fruit of that garden, he sins. And that sin redounds upon his children who end up being cursed. (laughs) Sound familiar, guys? The story of salvation history is a cyclical story. Over and over and over again, the same story is told to you. So you can start to get that pattern down. You start to see how God intervenes in our life. And how he constantly is working toward the restoration of his children. God knocks and we close the door. In closing the door, we receive death as our just reward. We need to simply apply this story over and over again throughout history. Okay? Now, we're going to move on from the flood narrative, but just barely. It's probably going to bring us to the end of our time this evening. And that is the next genealogies, which stopped Teresa from being able to read her Bible. But I'm going to tell you that this is a juicy one. Okay. But the whole story, the whole next genealogy that's given to us that begins in chapter 10, verse one is prepared for right here in this new garden that was planted. And the story of what takes place here now if you have children in the room i'll leave it up to you but this story has a little color to it and it may not be suitable so i will try to speak in vague terms i think you're smart enough to draw the conclusions if you can't figure it out give me a call after the talk and i'll explain it to you in explicit terms okay i think you can figure it out here we are in genesis chapter 9 verse 20 noah was the tiller of i'm sorry verse 18 Verse 18. Are you with me, Mike? Chapter 9, verse 18. The the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah from whom the whole earth was peopled. Stop. Notice how this is written for you. I'm going to reread it in the way you're supposed to be reading it. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three, not these four, were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was peopled. Okay? Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard and he drank from the wine. He became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham... The father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father 
and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon their shoulders, walked backwards to cover the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away. They did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done, or his little son had done to him, he said, cursed be Ham. Well, cur- no, it says cursed be Canaan. Well, that just doesn't seem right, guys, does it? Yeah, it doesn't seem right. No, remember that theme of seeing I was talking with you about earlier. To see when Genesis chapter one, God saw that it was good, right? To see something as good is to see it as desirable. Desire is the most fundamental movement of the will. And when our desires are oriented not at things, but at people, we call that, that, that movement of the will love. Love is the, is the communion of the person, right? No greater love has any man than to give his life for his friend, right? This is what love is. Um, God saw that it was good. To see is a, is a, is a, is a, is a way of, of, of communion, is it not? I can close my eyes now. I can close my eyes now and I can see the face of my wife. I can see my front door. In some mysterious and beautiful way, God has designed us so that in coming to know things, that which was formerly outside of us comes to be within us. You see that? Seeing is a fundamental theme in scripture. And, it, and, and in Genesis chapter one, it's a scene which causes a communion between God and his creation. And here in Genesis chapter nine, there's another kind of scene that takes place. So what's going on? What did, what did Ham do such that his, his son, Canaan, was cursed? And the key is given to us in the book of Leviticus. Okay, turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 18. And I think you guys can kind of figure this business out. We're going to look at uh, chapter 18, verse verse six leviticus 18 six are you there gina shane yeah angie everybody's there teresa leviticus chapter 18 verse six none of you shall approach anyone near of kin to him to uncover nakedness i am the lord you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father which is oh yeah the nakedness of your mother Now, stop for a moment and understand from a biblical perspective how the scriptures talk to us about marriage. Where was Adam? Where was Eve taken from at the time of creation? Remember, from the rib of Adam, right? And it says, then the two are joined together. They're no longer two, but one flesh, right? In Genesis chapter two. They become one flesh. But you know, the, the, the ancient Hebrew people were not like modern Americans who everything is a quality, right? Everything, all is sameness. No, no, they understood organic relationships. This is why St. Paul talks about marriage as he does. And, and we all get offended by it, right? Oh, in Ephesians chapter five, it, you know, this is why Ephesians chapter five is never read at, at weddings anymore. It used to be the only text you could read about the, the, the husband being the head of his wife and the wife being the body of the marriage. Yes. Because it was an organic relationship. He was taken forth from his side and returned, right? The woman is the body of this union and the man is the head. Okay. So to see your father's nakedness is to see his body, which is the nakedness of your mother. Yes. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the three sons of Noah. And Cain was not. He was a brother, or a half brother, but he was not the child of Noah. Am I clear about that? Now you can read it, read the narrative again. It makes a lot of sense. Chapter 9, verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Cain. And notice how every single time Ham's name is mentioned. Ham was the father of Canaan. Okay, this is what this guy did. Okay, and then, and then, of course, then his son is cursed because his son is the is the illicit fruit of this thing, terrible thing. And now we are here 
in verse 25, he said, cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also blessed. He also said, blessed by the Lord my God be Shem. And let Canaan be his slave. And enlarge Japheth and so forth. Notice this handing on now. This theme of blessing, which God blessed Noah with. Or Adam with. And which, uh, which, with, which Adam blessed Seth with is now handed on generation to generation. This is the blessing of a father to the son, that that son might become the head of the household, that he might become the king to replace the king. Yeah, that Adam might be a king in the footsteps of God who is king. Noah blessed his son Shem, who is the head of the family. Why would Ham do this? And notice who the oldest son is. The oldest son is the one that becomes head of the family naturally. Now we're going to see that break up through salvation history, but the natural progression is the oldest son becomes the head of the family. Well, why does Ham do this? This in the, in the ancient world, and you can write it down. You have to go there because I don't, I don't have time. Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 21. You can take a, not right now, not right now, write it down. Second Samuel chapter 16, verse 21. You could also look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 22. We're going to hit these through in our study together. Because if, if someone wanted to claim another's house, if someone wanted to des like destroy the other, guy, the other guy's headship in the house and take it from him, to take his kingship from him, there was one way you did it in the ancient world, and it was to do this. And that is to have a covenantal union with his significant other. Yes? Ham was not going to become head of the household. And because of this, he tried to become head over his head. He tried to make a name for himself to replace the one who had the name by right. Shem means name, yes? Does that make sense? And we're going to see the sons of Ham, Canaan, and the sons of Canaan do this over and over again throughout salvation history. They will again and again try to become head over their head. Yes. On a side note, St. Ephraim says this about the fall itself, that Eve ate before Adam, it says in Genesis chapter three, so that she might become head over her head an older in divinity in the presence of the one that was older than her in humanity. That's what St. Ephraim says. It's a continual struggle throughout salvation history to make a name for yourself rather than glorifying the name of God. Yes. And now from this point, the next genealogy begins in chapter 10, verse one. And I'm watching my time, Peter, don't worry. Okay. I'm going to do this genealogy very quickly, as quickly as we can. And we'll conclude our evening tonight by connecting to our next major figure in the story, who is Abraham. Okay, Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. Now notice what happens next, Mora. Chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, <laughs> and you stop reading your Bible, right? Don't stop reading your Bible. Notice something very unique which happens at this moment. Very unique in scripture. And that is Japheth, who is the youngest son, is listed first, which never happens in genealogies, which ought to make you say, wait, stop, what's going on? Why am I being told this? Okay, all right. These are the sons of, Jephthah, uh, sons of Japheth and so forth. Look at verse six, the sons of Ham. Look at verse 15, sons of Canaan. You notice he's thrown in there with his brothers. Okay, he's thrown in there under Ham, but he's still in the, in the he's got his genealogy because he's one of the brothers, but he's not one of the brothers. He's one of the brothers, but he's not one of the sons. Does that make sense? Okay, in verse 15. And then finally, Shem is listed last. Why is the guy that gets the blessing to become head of the household and king of the kingdom and priest of God's people listed last? And I'll tell you why, because your Bible is not written to be read the way you read it. It's written as a beautiful tapestry, a piece of art that's supposed to come off the page. 
So I need you to pick pieces up off the page and put them into the picture that they're supposed to be built into. The genealogy ends with Shem, the one who has the name, because of the next story in your Bible, which begins in verse in chapter 11. It's the story of Babel. Yeah? And what do we need to know about the story of Babel? You know the story of Babel. But the problem with you is you didn't know where the story of Babel fit in. Well, here it is right in the middle of the genealogy of the sons of Noah, right after the flood. Yeah? And it's here because the story of Babel has to do with the sons of Noah, particularly with the sons of Ham. Yes? Take a look at this. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the whole earth had one language, a few words, and men migrated from the east. Hold on to that. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now, who are these people living in the plain of Shinar? Go back with your Bibles to me, with me, to verse 6. Chapter 10, verse 6, sorry. Chapter 10, verse 6. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, you want to know, there's your list of bad boys in the Bible, right? You want a list of, of the bad nations that fight against God's people. There it is, the sons of Ham. Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, so these guys, okay, Rama and Sarada, the sons of Rama, so forth. Verse 8, Cush became the father of Nimrod, you know? You Nimrod? Couldn't you figure it out? He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Eric and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. The guys that build the Tower of Babel are the sons of the same guy that tried to become head over the house of God illicitly. Now let's keep reading chapter 11, verse one. Now the whole earth had one language and few words and the men migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they made bricks of stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build a city and a tower which is top is in heaven and let us make a shem for ourselves now take your eye down to verse 10 and another very strange thing takes place and that is the genealogy of shem is repeated again why because the author of the book of genesis wanted to present you with a beautiful portrait with a frame around it. The frame is the genealogy of Shem. This is why he had to reverse the genealogy of the sons so that you would see in the middle of that frame the truth about the Tower of Babel, the truth about the descendants of, Can of Canaan. These guys will never stop. Because over and over and again in salvation history, they have the same nature of their father who tries to make a name for himself, building a tower to heaven that they might be God. Instead of receiving the gift of God and glorifying his holy name. Now, 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 look, chapter 11, verse 10, we begin the next genealogy. Teresa says, I'm going to stop reading and I'm going to tell you, you can't. Okay, I'm going to finish up tonight with this. Chapter 11, verse 10. These are the descendants of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he became the father of Arkbukshad. Verse 12. When Arkbukshad lived, da, 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 he became the father of Shelah. Verse 14. When Shelah became, lived this long, he became the father of Eber. This is where, by the way, Eber, Hebrew. That's where we get the, the, the Hebrew people from. Okay. Uh, verse 18. Peleg. Verse 20. Reu. Verse 22. Sirug. Verse 24. Nahor. And Nahor lived 29 years. He became the father of Tira. And Nahor lived after the birth of Tira 109, 90 years, and he had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of? Woo! 
Abraham is the rightful descendant of the throne of Shem, who is the rightful descendant of the throne of Noah, who is the rightful descendant of the throne of Enoch, who is the rightful descendant of the throne of Seth, who is the rightful descendant of the throne of Adam, who is the rightful descendant of the throne of God. Salvation history is the story of the sons of the devil and the sons of God. As I said at the beginning, and the battlefield between them will be the battlefield of man's heart. Those who will try to make a Shem for themselves versus those who glorify the Lord. And those who glorify the Lord will be received back into his home to receive the gift of life. And those who side with the evil one will receive the only thing that the devil can give according to his nature, and that is death. My brothers and sisters, that's our, our program for this evening. Hold on. Don't leave. Don't leave. Watch this. Come here. You can do this. Come on. Let's go. From Adam and Eve. Our first parents' names were? Adam was the father of Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel, and God gave them a new son named Seth. Seth was the father of Enosh. Enosh was the father of Kenan. Kenan was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah, Mahalalel. Mahalalel was the father of Lamech, of Jared. Jared was the father of Enoch, who was taken up into heaven. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. Uh, who built the ark at the time of the flood. Noah had three sons named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah blessed Shem, and he became in the head of the family. Uh, Shem was the father of Arkbukshad. Arkbukshad was the father of Shelah. Shelah was the father of Eber, from whom the Hebrews descended. Eber was the father of Peleg. Peleg was the father of Reu. Reu was the father of Sirach. Sirag was the father of Nahor, and Nahor was the father of Terah, and Terah was the father of Abraham. Nice. Good job, son. Good job. Okay. Excellent. All right. Guys, you can do this, okay? And you can you know all the stories now. You can sort of fit them together from the creation story through that genealogy to the flood, through the genealogy to Abraham. And now we're going to be able to go really fast in our next session together. We go very fast through from, from, from Abraham uh, all the way to Moses, to the exit. It's going to be like, boom. So what's your homework? What do you want to do for your homework? I'm going to suggest is read through the whole book of Genesis. Okay. If you can't read through the whole book of Genesis, I would encourage you to read Genesis one through three. Okay. And then read the flood narrative. If you can, uh, in Genesis, uh, seven, eight, and nine. Um, and then, uh, and then just kind of really quickly go over those, those genealogies that we went over. Okay. We're so close. You can't imagine. It's so it, the, the Bible's not that long. There's not that many people. There's not that many events. And we're, we've, we've crossed almost the first half of it. And now only before us is the Exodus and the Babylonian captivity and Jesus it's there. Okay. You can do this together. Okay. Very quickly. And we're going to conclude in the beginning. God created our first parents. Their names were? Adam and Eve. And, they, and Adam and Eve had two sons. Their names were? Cain and Abel. And Cain did what to Abel? Cain killed Abel. And so God gave them a third son to replace Abel. His name Seth. was? Seth. And Seth had a great, 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 great grandson who was taken up into heaven. His name was? Enoch. Enoch. And Enoch had a great, uh, a great, great grandson or whatever who, who built the ark. And his name was? Noah. Noah had three sons. What were their names? Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Good, good, very good. And Shem had a great, 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 great grandson who God called out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the land as an inheritance. Abraham. Bingo. Well, Abraham. See that? She didn't know that before. So you guys can do this, okay? God bless you. I Please join us next week. And it's a very busy time, but I encourage you to join us next week and the week following. And we're going to go all the way through. And we're picking up all these little tools along the way that are going to help you build the bridges in between the stories you know and connect them so that you can see the line of the sons of God from Adam to Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. All right, Peter. Thank you, Father. I like how you put it, uh, previewing the next couple of weeks, because, you know, we've, we've been here for two hours. We're 10 chapters in. At this rate, we're going to need a couple of years together, but no, I'm telling it's going to start to speed up. We spend most of our time, don't worry, 
this is all planned. We spend most of our time here in Genesis because the rest of the Bible is so fast. And you're just going to need to know a few things. We're going to be all the way to Jesus. Not to worry. We're on, we're actually on track. No, this is awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Father. It's really cool to connect the dots. So they're all, you know, having only gone 10 chapters, we have made so many connections already that a lot of people would have just sped right through. Probably most of us did every time we read this for the first, second, third time, however. So this is awesome. Thank you. Um, you have time to stick around for let's, some okay. questions then? Let's okay. let's do it. Um, this question from Michael, quick clarification on uh, one of the genealogies we looked at. Yeah. In the first passage before the Tower of Babel about the descendants okay. of Shem, it goes five generations up to Peleg. Then it diverges on his brother Joktan and continues. What's the significance of the split? Then it seems to be rectified with the true line uh, after the Tower of Babel. I have no idea. Yeah. No. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. But I will tell you this. I will tell you this. That all that, that, that the years that are given um in in this and all of that's a, a it's good to be attentive to that there's so many questions like that so many details and numbers that i i literally i do i do not know but but it's very interesting i've done some research into the years of the of the patriarchs and how long they are and and every one of them is a pattern of either the number seven the number 40 the number 100, whatever the case may be, all of them. And um, there's a guy that gets into this. If you guys really want to get into this stuff, Umberto Casudo. Where is Umberto Casudo when you need him? Okay. Umberto Casudo. Now, listen, don't buy this book. It's expensive and it's really hard to read. This guy is so bright and he's in Hebrew. And I mean, it's, it's impossible to read this stuff. But if you really slug through it, uh, there's, they've got, he's got some amazing insights. And one of them is he talks about the, the, the things like that question, right? All these details, because nothing is put down there for without a reason. Okay. And he even makes that point about the, 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 um, the numerology of each one of the patriarchs and how each one of them is a multiplication of some significant, uh, uh, uh number in the Bible. Okay. That was a non-answer, but it, it was, but it was. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Marilyn here on screen. Go ahead and ask your question. We know Ham was cursed. We knew I was coming. And and then they had, what, Egypt and Canaan and all these countries. Where yeah. did Black people come from? Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you what, <laughs> Mo Mo Moses was not trying to make that point. Okay. I still want to know. It's a good question. But yeah. was 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 trying to make that point. Okay, some have said that they're just you know that I'm not going to get into it sure. because I again Moses's purpose is not that, and okay. don't make him say scientific things he's not or or whatever right. you know archaeological things he's not trying to make the point. Right. Okay? Right. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. A question from Kara just on the um, on the outline that we have that we'll post for as a resource on the page um, just from the thirty thousand foot view. The books of Tobit and Esther were listed under the Babylonian exile, she noticed, um, but what asks, wasn't Tobit depicted or depicting the Assyrian exile? Uh, oh, the he, okay. Look, it's, it's it, it, but the Assyrian exile and the Babylonian exile are like right next to each other and they're basically one. So I don't know. Pull that thing up, Peter. Yeah, here we go. This is what she's referring to. Boom. Use your mouse. So right. they're down here under Babylonian. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, Assyrian Babylonian exile is, is basically the same event, right? The Assyrians right. conquer close the to north, each other. and the Babylonians come in right after them, conquering the Assyrians and conquering everything in their path, and boom. So it's, it's, it's a one breakdown of the whole thing. Nice. Thank you. Harley, up on screen here. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this question doesn't uh, um, make me unpopular. I consider myself a traditional Catholic. Yeah. Um, uh, and I am a student of the fathers of the church. And you have mentioned many times Moses as the author of Genesis. And also you talked about the author of the book of Genesis. Yep. Um, um, I know many, many Catholic, um, traditional Catholic scholars. And of course, many of the fathers of the church who would not regard Moses as the author of the book of Genesis. Um, 
and um, relatedly, I would also ask, and so I want to know where do I stand? Uh, and secondly, yeah. I, I, you, you mentioned the importance of the original, of, of reading literally and the original intent of the author. Yeah. Um, again, going back to the Catholic tradition and the tradition of the fathers of the church, what about the importance of reading allegorically and isn't allegory and non-literal interpretation yeah. fundamental to Christianity in its rejection of the literalism, the blind literalism of the Jews? Yes. Good, very good question. The allegorical reading or typological reading of the sacred scriptures I get into in my series called Eden to Eden. It's on our website. You can go listen to it. Um, there are different senses of scripture in the Catholic tradition, as you know. Um, one of those senses is the historical literal, which is the foundation for the typological understanding. So what you want to do and we're trying to do in this study is get that historical literal foundation from which then you can draw your typological um, uh, uh, interpretation. And so I, I get into all, I go through this whole series like this in my Eden to Eden series on the Institute website, in which I talk about um, the, the allegorical uh, sense of scripture. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Mosaic authorship, I would encourage you to go back and read the, uh, um, our Lord's own sayings about Mosaic authorship about Moses and writing, um, and the overwhelming consensus of the church fathers regarding Mosaic authorship. Um, um, and then we are going in next the next class, the next session we're going to be in, we're also going to be talking about a little bit about how Genesis is written as an apologetic during the time of the Exodus, um, and why it was written the way it's written. And we're going to be getting into that a little bit. However, I would say this, that the, while the tradition of the church does name Moses as the author of Genesis, um, uh, some scholars have, have questioned that. Certainly parts of it seem to not be written by Moses, or at least parts of Exodus not written by Moses. And certainly there's certain parts which seem to be later, especially with names. Oftentimes names will be given a, late, a, a, a name that is given later rather than the earlier name, a name that's attached to a city or a people that's after the time of Moses, um, but that does not discount its original authorship, okay? So, yeah, I think I think that's enough. Thanks, Father. We uh, we should probably wrap up here in, in just yep. a minute, but Paula, you have been very patient here on screen, so why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Oh, can I, can I, can I add one thing to that, Peter? Also, oh, we yeah. have a talk by uh, Professor Eric Janisowski on how the Bible came to be. And I would encourage you to go listen to that talk, how the Bible came to be, Dr. Eric Janislawski. Okay. I was go just ahead, wondering, Father, you mentioned um, St. Ephraim's book a couple of times and some of the um, hymns from it. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could give me the hymns from that book because I happen to oh. have that book. Yeah, St. Ephraim, St. Ephraim always writes in hymns. I love, he was a deacon and a, a, a Syriac tradition and of course the liturgy is all sung he was used to singing and we sing the, the, all the scriptures and so he, he he authored all these all these poetic texts these hymns one of my favorites is the hymn his hymns against the heretics okay he sang the songs against the heretics because you got to love that but here this is hymns on paradise okay um and uh you can pick up so, some of his stuff free of charge at newadvent.org but i'd recommend going and getting a copy of this by saint vladimir's seminary press svs saint vladimir's seminary press puts out a lot of wonderful books by the church fathers usually paper bound so they're a little cheaper um uh, saint athanasius saint athanasius on the incarnation uh saint vladimir's seminary press republished that in a nice edition um, but this, I recommend hymns on paradise is a great meditation in church. Okay. Maybe stay after mass. Maybe you go for your private prayers, wonderful meditation on the scriptures, but you got to read it slowly. It's not something that's going to just, you know, if you want something a little bit more, um, say of a systematic approach to Genesis, St. Ephraim's commentary on the book of Genesis put out by Catholic university press a bit expensive when i bought it 20 years ago it was like 50 bucks 60 bucks um it is expensive so it may be a little bit out of people's um 
range, but it's a wonderful resource for commentary on the scriptures, on things like, you know, someone was asking me the other day about the mark that was put on Cain, right? So that others wouldn't kill him. And so what did I do? I went to St. Ephraim's commentary on Genesis. I also went to Umberto Casudo's commentary on Genesis and, you know, and started doing a little bit of research there for them. Okay. So those are a couple of resources. Peter, can we one last question be done? That's great. Yeah, sure. Let's, uh, let's take this one then here from Martha. She asks, all these gene genealogies you just explained are listed uh, having their own language and families, I think, of, of languages is what she's referring to. You could look at Ham, you know, bearing Egypt and Canaan, different languages, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, Genesis 11, one says the whole world had one language. So was, was there one or many here? Oh, well, the, 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 the traditional understanding of the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel, then God confused their languages in verse um, chapter 11, verse 7. This is the Lord speaking. Come, let us go down there and, and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth. And they are left off to build the city and so forth like that. Again, and the, uh, the beautiful understanding of this in re relation then to Pentecost and this coming together of all the languages of all these families coming back together in Jerusalem. And then this under this common understanding given by the spirit of God. And so a reversal of the fall of uh, called the fall of Babel or the sin of Babel takes place at the at the time of Pentecost. OK, I hope this is helpful for you guys. I know I was blasting a lot of stuff out at you. And I know Peter was concerned, like, you're not going to get through the whole Bible. We are. It's just that we you have to spend your time in Genesis. And if you don't get your tools in order and get your house in order, you're not going to be able to understand when you're outside the house. OK, um, and so those first you got to you got to be heavy there. Genesis one through three, the heaviest time of the flood and this and so forth. Abraham, a little bit. We're going to talk about not much. And off to the races from Abraham, you guys are going to know the story of his sons. We're going to be all of a sudden, we're going to be in Egypt and with the Exodus and out of there. Okay. So it's going to go very fast after this, where we had to get kind of our tools in place. All right. Well, thank you, Father. This has all been uh, really fantastic. So I encourage you, all of you, follow through on your homework, read, uh, read Genesis in the coming week, um, but then also hope to see you tomorrow with Monsignor Pope uh, for Maranatha come Lord Jesus, living in expectation of Christ. So hopefully we'll see you soon uh, here at the ICC. Otherwise, we'll be back same time, same place next week. Father, could you close us in prayer tonight? May the blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.